Okay, let's get started. I kind of feel like I need to apologize for being on this microphone because it's a small group, but I know it helps the folks watching this later in the recording, so happy to do that for everybody, and thanks for sitting in on this session. We're going to spend about an hour talking about uh, procurement and cooperative procurement, um, and hopefully it'll be somewhat entertaining and interesting because I know this isn't the most exciting topic, so we'll try to run through it and certainly be informal and give you a chance to ask any, any questions as well. So we're going to talk about public procurement trends and what procurement is and then what cooperative procurement is and then really understanding how different cooperatives work and how you might be able to use a cooperative in your area. So this is, I should have made that clear this morning if you all heard my brief announcement about uh, the organization I work with, Sourcewell. This is not necessarily about Sourcewell. This is about procurement and cooperative procurement. And we'll talk a little bit about Sourcewell, especially towards the end as an example of a co-op. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about other co-ops if you have questions about that as well. So this is just a little bit of an introduction. I think this slide, you know, in some parts of the country I do this presentation, I share that slide. People think that's pretty funny. I know in Montana that type of mustache is not all that uncommon. But uh, when I was in the fire service back on the East Coast, that was kind of a, an East Coast firefighter mustache thing. Um, I like to tell the story that my, when I met my ex-fiance, uh, we never got married, she saw me, and we were at a, some event, and her opening line to me was, you know, you might be a decent-looking guy if you shaved off that ridiculous-looking mustache. You notice we never actually got married, but we did have a, have a pretty good run. But anyway, uh, I was in the fire service uh, way back in the day and, and ended up being a, a chief officer for the city of Roanoke, Virginia. I was a training and tech rescue chief before I uh, went to work uh, with some other organizations. Right now, I live in Oregon, though. And again, when I, talk, when I give this presentation in other parts of the country, I have to explain a little about Oregon and how to pronounce Oregon, because a lot of people try to say Oregon and things like that back east, but I know you folks are a little bit more savvy about that. But uh, I am from the, the central part of the state, and, and some people don't realize that most of Oregon is dry and high desert, and I'm over on the high desert side of the state in Bend, Oregon. Some of you may know that. It's not that long of a drive from here. Um, but I am bi-coastal. I grew up on the East Coast, and I uh, worked uh, for fire departments out there and was started as a volunteer, and I had a great career uh, in the Uniform Fire Service for working for the International Association of Fire Chiefs as their director of professional development, and eventually moving west for quality of life reasons, and I was really grateful to have that opportunity to do that. I never planned to go back to the East Coast. It was a good place to live for a while and grow up, but much better be out west. I've had the opportunity to work with Montana Fire Chiefs quite a bit because I've also worked for Western Fire Chiefs Association. And of course, they've been very involved with Montana Chiefs, so um, I've had the pleasure of being out here quite a bit. I worked for NFPA for a bit. I was a Northwest Regional Director, so I was Montana's NFPA rep, and so I came to a lot of meetings out here for that as well. So it's good to always good to come back to Montana and, and get a chance to see, see friends there. Um, I've been involved with cooperative purchasing for about 17 years. I ran a program called Fire Rescue GPO, which was something started by Western Fire Chiefs. Uh, and I worked for and ran another national cooperative for a number of years. And then the last three years, I've been a consultant in this space and primarily working with Sourcewell, which is a government agency that does cooperative purchasing, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. So with that introduction in mind, I'm going to jump right in and start talking about uh, procurement and cooperative procurement. This slide is basically designed to tell you that procurement officials are facing challenges with the work that they have to do, and the number one challenge is staffing and not having enough staff to do the job, right? You guys have heard this all the time, right? I think every department says this. Well, that's something procurement officials are facing, and one of their challenges is getting suppliers to respond to solicitations and participate in procurement process. And then the other challenge is it takes a lot of time to do that, and so they don't, you know, that, that just takes more time. And then they don't have the staff to manage those procurement, those solicitations. Our friend from Billings back there is struggling because their procurement fish is like, no, we want to do that. We want to do all those, right? <laughs> they want to do those RFPs. But that's one of the challenges that they have is, is staffing. And um, so I want to start out by talking a little bit about what procurement is. Because again, as when we get into the fire service, none of us, I said this this morning tongue in cheek, but I'll ask this, this audience specifically, did anybody get into the fire service because they love government procurement and they thought it'd be really cool to buy stuff, you know, through a government procurement process, right? No. Um, so that's not, but, but if you're in fire service leadership and you're part of the 
part of the leadership or your chief officer, realistically, that is something that you need to consider because that is ultimately one of your responsibilities to play a role in that procurement process. If you're a chief of a fire district, you probably have ultimate authority on the final procurement decision. So that is something that you have to think about. And, and recognize that what government procurement is, is buying the stuff you need to buy to do the job you need to do while still having a fiduciary responsibility to the public funds that you're entrusted to spend, right? So um, that fiduciary responsibility is something we can all relate to because as fire chiefs and fire service leaders, we have, that, we have a lot of responsibility already, right? We're tr entrusted by the, with a public trust to go into people's homes at their worst moment and into their lives at their worst moment to take care of them. And so there's a lot of public trust there. Well, if you put yourself in the shoes of a procurement official, they have some public trust concerns as well because they're trusted with public dollars, which is a big deal, right? We all care about how government spends our money, right? It's all our, our tax dollars. So it's a, it's a big deal and it's something to think about with that fiduciary responsibility. The other thing to think about is, is what your procurement policy says. It's interesting to me how many fire departments I talk to and chiefs I talk to, and you start asking what their procurement policy is, and they get this look in their eyes where you realize you just ask them something that they realize they probably should know, but they don't yet, <laughs> or they haven't looked at it, or they haven't looked at it in a really long time, and they don't remember what it says. And so at a, at a base level, that's something that you should have at least some awareness of. And I recognize you come from different types of departments. I'm, I'm guessing there's some municipal departments in here. There's probably some volunteer departments. There's probably some fire districts. So there's some different governance structure. And you have different procurement policies and different people responsible for the procurement process that sign off on that. But ultimately, if you're the chief or a chief officer, you should at least understand what your procurement policy is and what the minimum requirements are around that. And so that's, a, that's kind of a, a takeaway or take home exercise for you is to make sure that you know that. If you don't have a procurement policy, or don't think you have one, you will need one if you ever want to spend FEMA federal dollars. That is now a requirement in, in the FEMA Federal uh, Register, CF, uh, CFR 2, Title 2, says that you have to have a documented procurement policy in order to be eligible to receive and spend federal grant dollars. So that's one thing to kind of think about. It doesn't have to be a complicated policy. It could be a one-pager, but you've got to have a policy, and you've got to show that you follow that policy. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the solicitation process and, and what is, um, hang on just a second here, um, what is the uh, uh, difference between lowest price and best value. So solicitation processes or RFP processes, people throw out different terms around that, can be based on a couple of different things. Some of them are based on best price only, right? Seal bid, lowest price, you literally, like kind of back in the old days of paper, like you, uh, the supplier, you put out specifications, the supplier responds, they write down their response on an, uh, and seal it up in an envelope and give it to you, and you open them up publicly so there can't be any funny business, and oh, this one's the lowest price, they're winning, no matter what it is, you know, even if their product doesn't, isn't what we wanted. Um, so that's just a kind of a basic level of, of lowest price only. It's much more rare for a procurement policy to require only lowest price. Typically now, there's an RFP process that allows you to base things on a best value evaluation. The difference is best value allows you to evaluate things more than just on price. Just price means that as long as they're a responsive bidder and that they met all your requirements, the only other thing you care about is who has the lowest price. It's a race to the bottom. That doesn't always work in our business because unlike the Parks and Rec Department that might be being buying a swing set or something, which like, oh darn, we didn't get the brand swing set we wanted, it's still gonna swing, right? Our, in our world, the equipment that we buy, our lives depend on it, right? Your lives depend on it, your, your staff's lives and the public whose lives you're entrusted depends on that equipment, on interoperability, on training requirements and things like that. So it's really nice to have a procurement process that allows you to evaluate other things than just lowest price. Things like warranty, service. Who's going to service this stuff? It's one thing if someone, that they deliver you some extrication gear and it shows up by the Amazon delivery truck, but what about training and service and things like that? So your local dealers, I know, play a big role in this and, and, is, and is important to you. So it's important to kind of understand the difference in your solicitation process. So even if you go, oh yeah, we have an RFP we have to do for certain things. All right, what is that RFP? What are the terms of that? Is it just based on price or is it based on best value? What are the, what are the conditions that you're uh, doing that evaluation on? 
And then finally, I want to talk about spending thresholds, because this is something that we need to establish to understand how a cooperative contract works, right? So the spending thresholds work something like this. Typically, there are two different levels of spending threshold. There's a lower limit and an upper limit. Everything below the lower limit, those are things that you as a chief are authorized to spend just because you, you can, right? And that's usually a dollar that's a few hundred bucks, it might be a few thousand bucks. Okay, you know, hey chief, we're out of copier paper for the copy machine, great, go down to the Staples and buy a box of copy paper for 50 bucks and put it on the city credit card, no big deal, right? You don't even have to get three prices or anything like that. Then, so that's everything below the lower limit. Then between the lower limit and the upper limit, that's usually when you have some kind of informal but documented process. This is where we often hear, oh, I have to get three, three quotes or three prices. It's usually not very formal. Those prices can be, you know, heck, some people can do a text message and a screenshot of it or an email or maybe you have some kind of formal form people fill out or some kind of process. But it's not a full RFP process. This is just getting three, three prices. That's just an example. Your, your process may vary, but that's an example of what that documented process is. So those are things that fall between the lower limit and, and the upper limit. Typically that upper limit is somewhere in the tens of thousands of dollar range. But this is, goes back to knowing what your procurement policy says. Usually state statute sets what those limits are, the upper and lower limits. However, local procurement policies can sometimes supersede that or be more stringent and have even different limits around that. So again, it goes back to knowing your limits. I'm not going to try to say what yours are because I could tell you what the Montana state statute says, but that might not be what your, your limits are. So above that upper limit, this is where you have the formal process. And usually we talk, we're talking about an RFP, a request for, pro request for proposal process. And, and this is the process that takes a long time, and it's no fun, usually, for you all to do. And quite frankly, it's no fun for the suppliers to do, because the suppliers take a lot of time to respond and put those binders together to do that. Uh, and then, unfortunately, after all that time that both sides do, you might end up needing, someone might be a winner that you actually weren't planning to, to buy from. And, you know, and that's not great, that's not a great outcome either. But that's typically above that upper threshold, that's when you're dealing with an RFP process. And I even, normally I try to meet everybody coming in, but we didn't really get a chance to do that. But I'm, I'm curious if we have suppliers in the room. I know we have plenty of fire service people. Are there any suppliers that want to say they're suppliers? No? Okay. It's great if we do. I usually have suppliers in here too. It's just good to know because we can kind of use some examples of that. Um, so those are the, those are the, diff the different levels in, in procurement process. Any question around that? Does that make sense? Does that line up with kind of what you know of your procurement policy and process? Okay. I'm going to go somewhat fast through this today because normally I have a little bit longer to do this. I want to make sure we cover everything. This is, has nothing to do with procurement at all. I just wanted to have a funny picture in there because, you know, gosh, procurement really isn't that exciting. But, but some of you may feel like this right now, especially if you're new into, to a role where you're doing procurement and you're going, wait a minute, I, how did I get in here as the, the sheepdog herder with all these sheep around me because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm really good at fighting fires and telling people how to fight fires, but I'm not good at procurement policy. So. Uh, but it's okay, because we're going to help you get there. So the other thing to think about is what your procurement strategy is. Wait, what? Procurement strategy? Why do I have to have a procurement strategy? Well, it's a good idea, because as, as, I, as I had a conversation with somebody in the back of the room today, sometimes you and your procurement official, or whoever ultimately is signing off on your procurement, don't see eye to eye on things. And so it's, it's really important to think about your procurement strategy overall and not just look at it as, oh, you know, we got to buy a new fire truck or we got to replace our turnout gear. I guess, you know, oh, I've been talking to some vendors. I guess I got to figure out what I got to do next. You know, that's kind of a kind of coming into it from, from, from the back end of it. You want to be proactive about your procurement strategy. And a lot of it is building relationships. So if you're in a municipal department, take some time to go talk to the procurement department or the finance department, whoever signs off on those things, and, you know, bring them out on a ride-along. Bring your procurement official out on a ride-along. Do as much of that kind of thing as you can, because when the time comes for you to explain to them why you need to do a procurement a certain way, because it's really important that you have this type of breathing apparatus because the bottles have to, you know, the thread pattern has to match up with the bottles when you do a quick change and things like that. They'll probably be a little bit more sympathetic to that after they've spent some time seeing what you do in the field. So, um, so make sure you're building some good relationships with your procurement officials and make sure that you have clear, transparent, good communications early on. 
Don't start bringing in vendors and looking at stuff and getting them to demonstrate things and getting them to help you with specifications and then go to your procurement official and say, hey, I'm thinking about buying this thing that the sales guy came out and told me it was really cool and I think we need it and so we want to buy it. What do we got to do now? Because you might have already gotten yourself in, in, a, in a pickle because the procurement, depending on your policy, they might say, well, you, we can't, they're not even eligible to participate in this RFP now because you've already gotten specs from them. They've given you some free samples. And so that disqualifies them from our, from our procurement process. Um, if it's federal dollars you're spending, it definitely disqualifies them. You can't get specifications from a vendor and then have them be the, the, the supplier that you're, you're buying the product from. And some of you are probably going, well, we've done that before. And you probably have, but if, you, if, if, ever, if that was ever audited or documented that that happened, you could be in trouble for that and actually have to repay those funds. So those are the kinds of things you need to think about, and, and that's why you need to start early in that process and, and take a little bit of time to, to create a strategy around your procurement process. Really, it's about knowing the rules and playing by them. Uh, for the most part, I think procurement officials are, are pretty good about wanting to help you. They just have their, they have their rules to follow, too, just like you do, right, and certain things that they need to do. Uh, and so if you communicate with them early and develop that strategy, usually they're pretty good about that. So give them a chance to help you uh, and, and be proactive with it. All right, any questions or thoughts around that? I it's kind of my soapbox on working with procurement officials, but I realize that's an important piece to, to how, what we do here. So... So let's get into cooperative procurement then. So cooperative procurement is really about sharing resources. It's about working together with and connecting suppliers and, and agencies that, that buy things. Um, and ultimately, it's about saving time and money, creating efficiencies to shorten that sales cycle. So this is something that's good for, for all sides. This is not just good for you, the, the government agency, or the, the, uh, the public safety agency. This is also good for suppliers, too. So that's, you know, you'll, it's not like you're, you're hurting them in the process. So in general, cooperative procurement in its simplest form is two or more governments making a purchase together, working together on a purchase. Uh, a little bit more fancy definition is the American Bar Association's model procurement code where it basically says conducted by, on, or behalf one or more governments uh, to, to conduct a, a procurement is defined in the code. It is defined in the code. Cooperative procurement is not some weird thing that I came up with or a few people came up with. It's something that's, that's defined in code. We'll even show you in Montana state statute where it's, it's authorized by state statute. So it's a, it's a real thing. <laughs> um, a lot of people call it piggybacking. Uh, or bridging, if you've heard those terms. Those are ways that you, you, you can use a cooperative contract. And it doesn't have to happen just at a big national level. It happens at a local and regional level all the time. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. But there's a significant trend upwards in use of cooperative contracts. Cooperative contracts have been around for decades, but only in the last five or 10 years have I seen it really grow in use. And so it's, some, it's hard to get data around this, but there, we're getting better at that. And it's 50 to 60% growth in the last five or six years is, is uh, in the cooperative procurement space. In fact, now, over 20% of cooperative, and this is a couple years old, so I'm, I'm going to say over, over 20% of state and local government spend goes through cooperative contracts. Another 20% goes off state contracts, which are arguably like a co-op contract. In fact, a lot of states use co-op contracts as their state contract. And then others are informal or sole source, and then the rest is, goes to a bid or some RFP process. And so we're just seeing this continual trend of people wanting to use co-ops more and more because they recognize the value in it and, and it saves them time and money in the process. So they got their start probably with state procurement programs. That's probably the original co-ops out there. And it used to be kind of commodity-based things like fuel oil, uh, copier paper, things that were really easy to all agree upon. I mean, you're not going to, you know, for the most part, you're going to say, oh, it's gasoline and it, and it works and it's got the right number of octanes and great, we'll buy it. If it's copier paper, sure, we can see it, it's white. Put it in the copy machine. So we're, we're all good on that, right? That's easy. When you start talking about complicated things like building a fire station or, or a fire apparatus, that's a little bit more complicated. But you know what? Over time, we figured out how to do cooperative contracts for just about any product or service that government buys. So, but it, it got its start in, in, most, in mostly that. And it was primarily a tool, again, to save time and money. So traditional cooperative purchasing, I would guess that some of you have been involved with this. This is when just two or more governments come together and work to do a solicitation together. 
right? And they, they usually do this through an intergovernmental agreement, and usually what it requires is that everybody signs off on it, so you and your neighboring agency say, we're going to buy breathing apparatus together because we want to be interoperable anyway, we all want to have the same kind, so let's go out to bid together, we'll put all our names on this, and we'll do it together. Um, and usually you get a little bit better pricing that way because you're guaranteeing more sales, right? Has anybody done that? Has anybody been involved with that at a local level? Yep. See some heads nodding, so that, that's not uncommon. That's cooperative purchasing in, in, its, in its simple, most local form, and that's, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, and you should you know, do that whenever it, whenever it works for you. Um, alternatively, the next, kind of next level up is when one agency acts as the lead agency, and then the surrounding agencies or the neighboring agencies are the piggybacking agencies. And this happens, I see this a lot with major metropolitan areas where you'll have a city that has a purchasing department and they're doing this RP and they're like, cool, we'll do this. And then the neighboring rural departments, maybe you don't have as much staff resources, go, hey, can we buy off of that contract once you, once you do it? Great, sure, so we'll name you in this, but we'll do all the work on the solicitation, but we'll name you as one of, the, one of the agencies that might buy off the future contracts from this solicitation. So that's, that's piggybacking or bridging, and then you as the piggybacking agencies would be considered the piggybacking agencies. The really important thing to do with that, though, the, the thing that, that you have to make sure is that the solicitation includes language that says these other agencies might buy off the resulting contract. If it doesn't say that at all, and it doesn't ideally name you as agencies that might do that, and you still use that contract, because I hear people doing that, they go, oh yeah, we just bought off the city's contract. Oh, cool, were you named in that? No, 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 we just figured they did it, so we could just use it. Um, you, you open yourself up potentially to a challenge, right? Because another a, a, a vendor could come along and say, wait a minute, I didn't know that other people were gonna buy off this. I would have responded with more aggressive pricing or you know, a vendor that didn't win the contract. They could challenge that, probably successfully, if, if that's not included in there. So make sure, again, this is a great way to do cooperative purchasing. Do it, but just make sure you're doing it right, and make sure that, that there's the right language in there. It doesn't have to be complicated. Your, your attorneys can help you with that, but it's essentially just including language saying who, who might use the resulting contracts. That's piggybacking uh, cooperative purchasing. A lot of times that is consummated through a, an intergovernmental agreement where, and would you guys do this all the time, like for mutual aid and stuff, that you have intergovernmental agreements saying, we'll, we'll respond here, you'll respond there, we'll do this for you, you'll do this for us. It's not a big deal, it's a simple, simple form, but a lot of times that's how it's consummated. And that's the kind of documentation that your procurement official is gonna want to put on file to demonstrate to the state auditor, if you're ever audited, that you met the requirements of their procurement process because you used your, the city that did the lead agency stuff, you use their procurement process, right? So that's a piggybacking type cooperative purchasing. Totally fine, happens all the time. Use that when, when that works for you. All right, so now I'm gonna kinda take you up to the next level cooperative procurement. And this is where we start talking about cooperative purchasing organizations. And some of you have, have used some of them. You've probably heard of some of them before. We'll give you some examples here in a minute. These can be uh, different types of organizations. They can be government entities. They can be for-profit companies. They can be nonprofit organizations. Uh, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of these cooperatives out there. Uh, again, some of you have heard of some and probably used some of them. They exist at the regional level. They exist at the state level. And they exist at a, at a national level. And so it's, it's important to recognize that there are a lot of them out there. It's also important to know what kind of structure they are. Are they a for-profit company? Are they a government? Are they a nonprofit? Because it's kind of nice to know who you're working with and who basically you're giving your business to. And I'm not suggesting that any of them are better than the others. It's just important to know what they are and who they are and, and who's getting paid, right? That kind of helps you understand um, kind of their motivations behind that. The important thing to realize, though, is that somewhere in that mix, one of them, some, there has to be a government agency involved because it has to be a government agency creating the contract. If you work with a cooperative and they're a nonprofit association and they say, yeah, we did this solicitation and we have contracts, so they were publicly bid and awarded and everything, and, they, and you go, well, who's the lead agency? And they say, well, it was just us, you know, we're a nonprofit and we did it. That probably doesn't meet your requirements because they're not a government agency. It has to be another government agency doing the solicitation. It can't just be a nonprofit or a for profit company doing a solicitation. That doesn't count as a, as a legitimate cooperative contract that meets your statutory requirements. At least I'd be really surprised. I've never seen it. I've never seen that work. Sometimes they're called third party aggregators too. 
Um, so essentially what these organizations do is they work with a government agency or they are their own government agency to create a solicitation, an RFP, um, to, uh, to, for a given product or service. And then suppliers respond to that RFP and then they're evaluated and then there's an award process and then that awarded contract can then be used by members of that cooperative to meet their solicitation requirements. Always use that term, meet your solicitation requirements. If you go talk to your procurement official and say, hey, I figured out a way to get around our procurement requirements, that's not going to work. So just make sure you use that, that phrasing, right? So, um, so, you, so they work with the lead agency to create that solicitation, to create a contract. What's different about co-op solicitations is when you're doing a solicitation for a fire truck, you're going to say, I want this truck, and I want it to be red, and I want it to have this thickness frame rails and this compartment and blah, blah, blah. When a co-op does that solicitation, they're going to say, fire trucks. I mean, a little more than that, but they're going to be pretty broad. They're going to say, we're interested in fire apparatus, this type and this type and this type. Tell us what you got and let us know what you can sell off this contract. And most people respond essentially with their entire catalog and all their options. And so that means if they're awarded a contract and you're using that contract to buy your fire apparatus off of it, you have everything they responded with. And if they responded with everything they offer, then that means you can basically spec out whatever truck you want and it's still on the contract. So a pretty powerful tool, but very different solicitation than the kind of solicitation you do locally. And that's important to know because if you're looking at one of these solicitations and think about using that contract, you might look at it and go, well, where are the specs? You know, where are the, where's all the specs that normally we do? It won't look like that. The specs will be very broad. The specs for, that you need for your truck, you'll still have to produce those. Like You'll still have to take that to the manufacturer you want to use and give them what you want them to build. But, those, but, there's, but it doesn't go through that RFP process. That's just what's on the contract, if that makes sense. A lot of times um, there is still some kind of intergovernmental agreement or interlocal agreement that you sign with that lead agency to demonstrate that you're using that cooperative contract. And then the cooperative's business then, so any co-op, their business is to guide everybody through this process. So that's what, they, that's what they do and why they do it, is they're going to help you and your procurement official understand our procurement process and the, the, the documentation that goes along with it. And they're also going to help the vendor or the supplier how to use the contract and how to make sure they're doing everything right and they're adhering to what the contract said. And that's the cooperative's business, or that's their job is to help you with that. And we'll talk about cooperatives a little bit more and how you evaluate them later. But if you're not getting that from the cooperative you're using, then maybe you're not using the right cooperative, you know, because there's not all cooperatives are created equal. So that's another thing to think about. All right. I used to be a training chief, and I know we're visual learners, so this is, what, this is my first uh, visual learning uh, effort here to show you how this works. So we will use Sourcewell as an example. Sourcewell is a government agency. Sourcewell is a weird name for a government agency. It's a brilliant name for a co-op, but it's a weird name for a government agency. They used to be called National Joint Powers Alliance. They're a special service district in the state of Minnesota, uh, but everybody thought they were the New Jersey Podiatrist Association or something with NJPA. So a couple years ago in state statute, they changed their name to Sourcewell. So, Sourcewell will do a solicitation, uh, and then all the suppliers will respond, uh, and then they'll get awarded a contract, and then they have a contract with Sourcewell. Um, often, with co-op contracts, there's a multiple award allowed, which is kind of different, right? Again, if you're buying a fire apparatus, you're not going to award it to Pierce and Rosenbauer and E1. You're going to award it to whichever one you buy, right? Um, with a co-op, they're going to likely do a multiple award. Because a co-op, especially a national co-op, needs to meet the needs of all their members across the country. And we all know that not everybody wants the same kind of fire truck. I keep using that as an example because it's an easy one. So they'll often do a multiple award. So they have multiple options to satisfy the needs of their members. But it doesn't mean that everybody gets awarded. Some co-ops tend to do that. They tend to award just about everybody. Other co-ops don't. And that, that can make a difference to your procurement official on how comfortable they are using that co-op contract. Because if everybody gets awarded, it starts to look like, wait a minute, was this really a solicitation process or was this just a paperwork exercise? And am I going to allow that to, to meet my procurement requirements? So they'll make the award. Then the supplier holds that contract. Then the, on the other end of the spectrum, the, the co-op, whoever it is, works with member agencies to create a membership or an account. I'd be willing to bet that many of you in this room already have an account with Sourcewell because they've been doing this forever and they have lots of accounts set up with government agencies across the nation. 50,000 government agencies actually are actively using their contracts right now. So they have an account. That account establishes that legal authority between the government agency and the procuring 
the procurement organization. And so that's that, that's that piggyback piece. And then the last piece then is this. You, as a government agency, actually work directly with the supplier. You don't actually go through the procurement organization, the co-op at all. You work directly with the supplier on the purchase. You just say, hey, I want to use a co-op contract instead of going through our own procurement process. And the supplier says, cool, we have that co-op contract. We want that too because we don't want to go through the procurement process. And then you sign the deal. And you just bring that, all that paperwork with you from the co-op that they provide you, and you put it in a file, and then that file is there for audit records. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, but essentially, that's what this represents, and essentially, that's how it works. Another visual learning tool here. So, typically, in the stage of the procurement process, you start by defining need. Chief, we've got to buy a new fire truck. Ours is wearing out. Uh, well, okay, we need a new fire truck. Let's create specs. Oh, this is when it really slows down, right? Let's create an apparatus specification committee, and they'll meet for, for a year and talk about what they want and all the bells and whistles. Okay, we got the specs now. Uh, now we got to do the RFP. So we put it out, we write the RFP, we put it out, it's got to be out for so long, then we get all the bids back, and we got to evaluate them, and then we got to do an intent to award, and then there's a challenge period. So that thing takes a while as well. Finally, you get to place the order. That represents the amount of time your procurement process takes, whatever that is probably a few months at least, right? So with a co-op contract, you still have to create some specifications, but it's usually a lot quicker because the co-op contract already has done some of that for you because it shows you what's available. And then essentially you just stick the co-op in there in the middle and then you place the order, obviously creating the time savings. So that's kind of a visual representation of why a co-op contract can save you time in that procurement process. And time is money, right? Because time represents staff time. Time, and the other thing it saves you is actual pricing. Sometimes a co-op contract will give you better pricing. And I always emphasize sometimes, because people that think, oh, this is about getting better pricing and national pricing, yes. Sometimes you'll get better pricing, but not always. A lot of times it'll be the same pricing, but what you are saving is time, and you're also ensuring that you're buying what you want and not what the procurement process spits out on the other end, which might not be the, the supplier that you had wanted to work with. Questions in general? Um, I'm going to just put all these up here and not go through each one of them. Uh, the point of this slide is that there's value on, on all sides of the table for this. You save time in the process, you potentially save money, it gives you access to a wide range of contracts. As when you start working with co-ops, you'll find out, oh gosh, they have contracts for other stuff that we're buying too. I didn't realize that. Oh, their pricing's better on this. Oh, this is, you know, this is cool. So you, it's, it's good for you in many ways. It's also nice because the co-op helps you. They have procurement officials and staff that'll answer your calls and help you, you know, work through the process. They'll help you with a supplier if you're having a supplier issue because they do so much business with that supplier. They can often help with that. So they're, they're there to help. Um, in, the, in the case of Sourcewell, they're a government agency. They're there to help you. There's no charge for that. And usually there's no charge for you to use any co-op. Um, they're, they're truly there to help, help you through that process. On the supplier side of things, the, um, the vendor side of things, they like it too because, again, they don't have to respond to a bunch of solicitations. They don't have to risk losing a sale because they lost out on some RFP process. And they do pay a fee. You're probably wondering, wait a minute, somebody's got to make some money out of this, right? So suppliers do pay a fee. Usually, uh, I've never seen a co-op that doesn't really do it this way, but they pay a very small admin fee only for sales made off the contract. They know what that fee is up front, and, it's, and they can work it in just a cost doing business, and they don't mind paying that fee because they're only paying it when they're making a sale, and they're paying it when they're making a sale that's guaranteed rather than having to go to, through a bid process and potentially not getting the business. So I've never, once any supplier that's really gotten into it and started using co-ops, they're oh, this is fantastic. I, I love having that as a tool. They look at it as a tool. And what they sh how they typically use it is they keep it in their hip pocket, and they're working with you, and they get to the point where they go, you go, this is great. I want to buy this. Unfortunately, we got to go to bid. You know, I'll go, we'll go through the bid process, and good luck. And then the supplier goes, wait a minute. We've got a co-op contract. Maybe you can use that and piggyback off of that, and then you don't have to go to bid, and we don't have to go to do that bid process. So everybody, everybody tends to enjoy or, or appreciate that co-op process. Questions? All right, so we've kind of covered a little, this a little bit, but in general, co-ops tend to be pretty easy to use. 
uh, because of the staff that they have available to you. The other thing is sole source. And I, like to, I like to mention this because some people say, yeah, but we use sole source because, you know, we can say, well, we got to use, we have to have MSA because we always had MSA and they've got to match up and blah, blah, blah. Cool. It still takes some work to do sole source, right? You still have to document that. You still have to prove that. And you still run the risk of a procurement official going, wait a minute, I don't know if this is really sole source. Are you sure? Let's go to bid just to make sure. So a co-op contract sort of supersedes the sole source requirement because in a way you're saying, okay, let's go to bid. Let's say it's not sole source. We're going to bid. But you know what? To meet our bid requirements, we're going to use this co-op contract and piggyback off of it so we don't actually have to go through the whole RFP process. But we went to bid. We just used someone else, the other government's bid process for that. So it's still really helpful even in a sole source or what would have been a sole source situation. You can use it with grant funds. We get this question a lot, uh, especially with FEMA grant funds. They're absolutely fine with it as long as you have a documented procurement policy and as long as your procurement policy allows you to use co-ops. So if your procurement policy doesn't allow you to use co-ops, then you can't use a co-op with federal grant funds. But if it does allow you to use co-op, you, you can use it for federal grant funds. And again, there's typically no fees for you to participate. It is allowed in all 50 states by state statute. Uh, but again, it has to co-op has the contract has to be created in a specific way with specific language, and there has to be a lot of documentation available to you uh, by that co-op to to make to make that okay. And that language has to be in that uh, in that process. So make sure that if you're doing this at a regional or local level, that you do that intentionally and that you have the right language in there to make it clear who's going to use the resulting contracts. All right, legal authority. This is a really exciting part. So state statute usually allows it. Um, it's important that your local policy doesn't prohibit it uh, because you could have local situations where you have a policy that prohibits it or you could have a procurement official who just doesn't like it and doesn't want you to do it. And then that's a, that's a stickier problem, right? Then that becomes a relationship and a, and a communication thing to try to work through that. Um, the vast majority of jurisdictions allow for cooperative purchasing, and for no other reason, through the Joint Powers Acts. Every state has st statutes have, has language about joint powers. Those are the same statutes that allow you to work together on mutual aid and all kinds of things. So you can always rely on the Joint Powers Act to do that. Now, most state statutes actually have, and I think it's my uh, next slide, but most state statutes have statutory language that specifically calls out using cooperative contracts because it's gotten so common now. Montana actually has that as well. Um, Typically what, what your local procurement officials will like to see is a process that's as similar to your own as possible, but as long as the lead agency that created the contract followed their procurement policy to the letter of the law, then they're okay with it. Because they go, you know what, that government agency did it their way correctly. I'm going to trust that their way is a little different than ours, but they had their way of doing it, so that policy is good with us. You can use the co-op contract. That's typically what we see. It all comes back to knowing what your procurement policy says, though, which is what I, what I mentioned at the beginning of this. This is the I reading portion portion of the class here. I don't expect you to read that, nor am I going to read that to you. The point is that there are statutory, there is statutory language in, in Montana uh, where it's, this one actually is, this section is called Cooperative Purchasing Authorized. And it talks about how uh, government units can use cooperative purchasing. This is designed for state agencies, but there's also a section of this code that mentions that localities can adopt this as well. Um, and then there's also your Joint Powers Acts that allow you to, to do that. Um, this is some of the language that talks about intergovernmental cooperation and, and the definition of that. And it, and it includes language that talks about governmental units being uh, localities within or outside of the state of Montana. So it, it specifically calls out using co-op contracts that come from outside of the state. I am not an attorney. You need to definitely uh, consult with your agency's attorney and procurement official and whoever is responsible for this to make sure that you're okay and have the same interpretation of the statutes. But the point is there is language there and it's worth having that conversation and, and ideally not letting them just say, oh, I don't think we can do that, it's not legal. Um, if, if their objection is it's not legal, that's something that we can help you with as well. We have a team of, of attorneys that can help have those conversations as well. 
All right, let's talk about the we and who some of these other co-ops are out there. So I mentioned Sourcewell and Fire Rescue GPO. We'll talk about them a little bit more. Houston Galveston Area Cooperative, HGAC. I suspect some of you have heard of them, probably bought fire apparatus off of them. They're, they're very common in the fire apparatus space. They're also a government agency. They're a special service district in the state of Texas, and they do great work as well. We work with them cooperatively a little bit, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, the difference is they're based in Texas, so they follow Texas procurement law. That's cool, but Texas procurement law has some, uh, some idiosyncrasies around um, government purchasing of fleet vehicles, right? And that falls in the fire apparatus. So they have certain requirements that are Texas-based, which are absolutely fine, but it's important to realize that, that they're following Texas procurement law, and not all cooperatives outside of Texas have to do that. So there's things like published and unpublished options and things like that that are peculiar to Texas and not to other, other co-ops. So that's something to keep in mind if you're doing fire apparatus and looking at different co-op options. Um, Omnia Partners, so HJC is another government agency. Omnia Partners is a for-profit company, and they use different local governments around the country to be their lead agency. And then Omnia Partners manages the resulting contracts. Also a completely legitimate and great way to do it. It's just a different model, right? So they, Omnia, Omnia makes money off that for, for, for themselves. NASPO Value Point is a National Association of State Procurement Officials. So that's a nonprofit example. And they run a program called Value Point, And that's state by state based. They use state agencies as a lead agency. And different states sign on to that to, to sign up to use those contracts. Also a great way to do it. I'm just giving you some examples of some different uh, ways in which co-ops are established. They're all, all of those examples are you know, very legitimate and get used a lot, and, and there's nothing, nothing wrong with any of them. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of others. And in fact, now you're in a position of having to evaluate which cooperative you're going to use, right? And so there's a lot of things to think about there. I won't do too, get too much in the weeds just for the sake of time, but um, a lot of this is using your gut. If, if the cooperative is not very responsive to you or doesn't make information readily available to you on their website or as a result of your inquiry, then that might not be the cooperative for you to use because you have to trust these folks to have done the procurement process in your place and provide you with the proper documentation. So that's something to, to look at. Uh, you need to look at who does the actual solicitation and make sure that they did it in the way that they're supposed to do it. What is the level of customer service you get? What kind of answers do you get to your questions? Uh, do you feel comfortable using them in place of your own procurement process? Um, we talked about their, their availability of information. Um, the other thing is, are they part of a, of a national association for cooperatives? What? Yes, there's an association for everything out there, and there's an association for cooperatives. It's called NCPP, National Cooperative Purchasing Partners. And uh, they have many different cooperatives that are members of them, and they have a free roadmap. That's the website you can go to. That's the, the roadmap is kind of in the background there. And that gives you a guide to how to use uh, cooperatives uh, successfully. And that, you know, honestly, that would probably be something good to take back to your, your person in Billings and show them that a little bit. It might help. All right, then you have to evaluate the contract. And so that's a, like, wait a minute, I thought I'd have a contract. We can just use that thing, right? Sort of, except you want to make sure that the pricing in that contract meets what the, what the person trying to sell you stuff says, right? So if they say, oh, we're going to give you 10% off list on all this, but you pull up the co-op contract and it says 15%, well, you have a conversation to have, right? Say, so wait a minute. Contract says 15% here, right? So there's a little bit of thing, some things you need to do around that. What about the terms and conditions? What if your terms and conditions are different than the co-op? What the heck does Minnesota Sourcewell know about your terms and conditions, right, in your locality, Montana? Well, the good thing is a lot of co-op contracts have flexibility with terms and conditions. So if you have specific requirements in your locality for terms and conditions, it's likely you can modify the terms and conditions. It's, it's allowed in the contract to do that. So you might need to work through that, whatever that is, whether it's bonding or insurance requirements or things like that. Um, local preference or is, is often important. Award and maturity dates is important, too. If you're getting ready to buy a piece of fire apparatus, we know it takes a while for them to build that, especially now, and deliver it. If you're going to use this co-op contract, and the co-op contract expires in two months, and you're not going to take delivery on this piece of apparatus for six months, well, that might be a problem, right? So you need to look at what the maturity date of the co-op contract is to make sure it's still going to be good. Or let's say you're using this co-op contract to buy some training software, and you're planning to implement this software and use it over years, and you're going to have to buy updates to it a few years later, you want to make sure that co-op contract's good for the, for the term that you're planning to use that service. 
Um, as, as I said, there's a lot of flexibilities contracts, or there could be or should be. If the co-op says to you, oh, no, we don't have any flexibility terms and conditions, and you need them, well, that's, that's an indication maybe that's not the right co-op contract for you. So those are some of the things you need to look at. The other thing is co-op contracts tend to be ceiling-based prices, pricing. So what I mean by that is, I'll use that example a minute ago, if say you get 10% off list on the co-op pricing. Because usually co-op contracts are a discount off list pricing. It's not a fixed price, it's a discount off list. And that way if the list price changes, they don't have to modify the contract. So if the, if the discount is 10% off list, that's the least discount they can offer you while you're using that contract. It doesn't mean that they can't sell it to you for 20% off list, because no procurement official, I don't think, is going to say, wait a minute, we can't, we can't buy this at 20% off. The contract says it's only 10% off, right? They're going to accept that additional discount off list. So it's usually ceiling-based pricing. Now, I'm not suggesting you need to go beat up the supplier and say, hey, give me even better pricing. But it is worth asking that, having that conversation. Is this really the best pricing? A lot of times it will be. They'll go, Phew, you know, that's the bet. We, I can't believe we offered 20% off on this, you know, on this contract pricing. And, you know, that's the best we give anybody. And, you know, that, that's it, right? That's fine. But, but it is ceiling-based pricing. Um, you do need to establish your legal authority. So at this point, if you're not already thinking this, you're probably going, wait a minute, I don't know if I can do this. I need to go back and talk to all the right people in my organization to make sure we can do this. It might be really simple. It might be, oh yeah, we do this all the time, no problem, good to go. Or it might be you have to do some things. Maybe there's a board resolution you have to pass. Maybe there's some documentation you have to do. Figure out what that is and do that. Also look at the political landscape. It might be that for whatever reason, you don't want to use a co-op contract. You want to go to bid because one of the city council people's spouse is, you know, works for one of the vendors or something. And you just want to go to bid to make sure nobody can complain about anything. So there's a lot of factors to consider in how you're going to use that contract. But make sure you document the process no matter what you do and you get the paperwork that you need to demonstrate that you met your procurement requirements and you keep that on file. Because just because you're using this, it's cool, it saves you a lot of time, but you still got to document it or else you can get in trouble down the road for, for not meeting your procurement requirement. Then you work with a supplier directly. Uh, you do usually have to have some kind of member number with the co-op to, to be able to do this process. You have, to have some account with the co-op. Again, there's no, no fee for that usually. Um, so you document your member number on the contract or in that purchase price or on the purchase order or something. It's real easy to get your member number usually from the co-op. Um, and then uh, maintain that for, for audit records. All right, before I talk about this example, any questions in general about Cooperative purchasing or anything I covered is a lot of information. I'm sure for some of you it's good. Yes, sir. So, for the purpose of a FEMA grant, uh, <clears throat> making the application and having estimates, if you were already a member of a cooperative agreement, can you use the pricing without uh, disallowing that vendor? Great question. So, the question was for the sake of the recording <laughs> is if you're using a FEMA grant, and can you know? Can you use co-op contract pricing as examples without violating the the, the pro prohibition against working with a supplier on specs and pricing and all? I don't know. <laughs> That's a really good question. My answer, my opinion is yes, because you're not working directly with a supplier. You're getting publicly, you're getting information that's publicly available. This is not something you're getting directly from a supplier. This is public information, right? Because it's a, it's already a documented government contract that exists that anybody can see. So I don't think that's a problem. But I would I would rather you ask that of your regional FEMA representative before you do that and get in trouble because they sometimes have different opinions. So I think it's fine, but that would be my answer. Any other questions? Good question. So let's talk a little bit about this example, and that'll give you it might might reinforce some of this, and then we'll wrap it up and and get you to happy hour. So the Fire Rescue GPO was created by the Western Fire Chiefs Association, Oregon Fire Chiefs Association, about 20 years ago. They did it in partnership with all the state chiefs associations in the Western Division, including Montana Fire Chiefs, and then ultimately with the IFC and all the IF, other IFC divisions. And so over 20 years, this program grew into a national cooperative procurement program, and it served many of you, maybe some people in this room, you know, pretty well. It, it was a good program. I used to run it, and we grew over, over the years, but we were still relatively small compared to some of these other co-ops. Revenue was shared from that program with Chiefs Association where the purchases were made. So some Chiefs Associations made some pretty good money off of this. 
I'll be honest, Montana Fire Chiefs never did make a whole lot of money off of it because you don't buy as much here and people weren't using co-op contracts as much here, but it has been a nice revenue generator for a lot of Fire Chiefs associations, including the Western Fire Chiefs, which is the division that you reside in. Um, the other thing is we got a lot of great guidance back from fire chiefs about how, how the program should operate, who we should go after for suppliers, and what kind of contracts we needed to have. So it's been a great program. It is now part of SourceWell. Western Fire Chiefs created a new partnership with SourceWell. SourceWell is a government agency, and that's where Fire Rescue GPO now resides. And essentially, Fire Rescue GPO is now SourceWell, and so from here on out, it's going to basically be SourceWell is your, is your co-op that you have a partnership with. And so who is SourceWell? We talked about this a little bit before. They're a government agency that does cooperative purchasing, among other things. They do a lot of services for their five-county region. They serve five of the poorest counties in Minnesota. They provide a lot of services in education and in public safety there. They did $5 billion last year in sales through their co-op contracts. That's not their revenue. That's how much was sold through co-op contracts. Their revenue was a tiny fraction of that. Uh, they have over 400 suppliers on contract. I think we're at 450 now. There's 50,000 actively participating government agencies. There's about 200 staff people. They work out of Staples, Minnesota, which is about as small a town as you're going to find anywhere in Montana. And they have this big office there. And uh, a lot of great folks. All, they're all Minnesota nice. And they are very responsive. We have staff in the legal team. We have staff that work with you. We have staff that work with procurement. We have, you know, they have a lot of people that will help you answer questions about your program. Look, it's the reason I'm working for them. I used to run another co-op. I saw what they were doing in, in, the, in this market, and I wanted to be a part of them because you know, my reputation and the credibility is really important, especially in this industry, in the fire industry, and I thought they were a good organization for us to be hitched to. So that's why we're there. Um, these are some of the contracts that they have in the public safety space. We are constantly doing solicitations in the public safety space. Uh, we're redoing right now. The fire apparatus solicitation is published again. We've had one before. We have all the major fire apparatus manufacturers on contract. I'm hoping this round we'll get a lot more of the regional manufacturers and brush truck manufacturers on contract as well. Um, but all of this is available on our website. I also had, had our office do a little research to see who's been using SourceWell contracts in Montana because some of you might be going, well, I don't know, I've never heard of SourceWell, who's used this, right? So here's, here's just a few examples. Over the last two years, there's been over $20 million spent through SourceWell contracts in the state of Montana. And this is the kind of information that can be really helpful when you're talking to your folks back home about whether or not you can do this or not, right? And here's some examples of some, some specific departments that have spent money, quite a bit of money, like with Rosenbauer, obviously. CDWG is a uh, technology uh, uh, equipment provider. Um, and then uh, Ellen Curtis, you guys probably know who Ellen Curtis is. Those are just some examples. We also have uh, MES on contract. We have, again, all the major fire apparatus folks on contract. I'm not calling those guys out as, as better than the rest because we're, we're pretty agnostic. We, we support any of the vendors that we have on contract. So just some examples of that. Uh, these are some of the solicitations that we have done recently and or that we're getting ready to do. Uh, critical care, resuscitation, EMS equipment in the middle is the one coming up. Uh, almost all the other ones have been done and are completed and, and are on contract. So that's kind of some of the things that we have going on. Uh, kind of a, a summary here, there's no cost for you for membership. There's no obligation for you using SourceWell contracts. And that's true for just about any contract, any, any co-op. It's just a resource for you. It doesn't really hurt to look into it, to set up an account. Uh, again, you probably already have an account with SourceWell. You can go on their website and see if you already have an account. It's likely that someone in your organization has set one up at some point. It might be, uh, might be old, but it's probably in there. Um, and it just streamlines the process and doesn't, you know, allows you to buy what you want to buy and shorten that sales cycle. And, and so most people, in, in my experience in this industry, like that, right? If, they, if you can help do that, that sounds pretty good. And, uh, and so it's, I, I think in general it's a, it's a valuable tool. Um, I've got a few, I've got some business cards up here. I've got a couple of post, I've got some postcards that have just a little bit of basic information on the website if you want to take it back home to look at that. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll be around for a little bit. Otherwise, I'm flying back to Oregon later tonight, so I won't see you at the, the banquet or the concert. But um, I appreciate your time, and especially late Friday afternoon, sitting here listening about procurement. So thank you. <laughs>